All right, so I am going to get started. Uh, thank you again uh, to everyone who is here. I want to welcome you to the annual Careers in Public Health panel. Again, my name is Elisa Crossman, and I'm an undergraduate advisor in the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science. Tonight, we will hear perspectives from five professionals working in various careers within the field of public health. I want to encourage you to use their answers as a starting point for your journey into researching the graduate programs and career paths that are the best fit for you. For more information about graduate school and careers in public health, please visit the Planning Your Future tab at ph.ucsd.edu backslash undergrad. I want to remind you that today's event will be recorded and will be available on the public health website following the event. Our panelist information and contacts can also be found on our website on our news and workshops pages. Now, I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Please tell us your name, your degree, area of focus in public health, workplace, and position. Why don't we start with Lauren. Wonderful, I'm so happy to be here and to break the ice. So my name is Lauren Weiner. Um, I have a PhD in public health from UCSD from the JDP. I just finished up last year in 2021 in the health behavior track. Um, and my area of focus in public health is currently in digital health and specifically in digital therapeutics, which is the idea of using software to actually uh, treat diseases, which is really exciting. Um, I work at Happify Health, a digital mental health startup company, and I am on the clinical research and development team as a research scientist. Any other detail I should be providing at this point? I know we're going to get into the details. Well, that's perfect, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, Ernesto? Yeah, sure. So hi. Thank, welcome, everyone. Um, good to be here. I am Ernesto Ramirez. I am also a JDP graduate. I graduated from the health behavior track um, in 2016. Feels like forever ago, but wasn't that long ago. Uh, I work also in the digital health space. I am a, a senior manager at Evidation Health, where we focus on bringing person-generated health data, so data like surveys, uh, patient reported outcomes, but the data you're contributing through Strava, your wearable devices, your Apple Watch, your Fitbits, so on and so forth, bringing that to bear on interesting problems uh, for our clients across biopharma, government, and other healthcare organizations. Thank you, Ernesto. And Carolina. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolina. I actually am a volunteer and student services coordinator for Family Health Centers of San Diego. It's a huge community clinic um, out here in San Diego. And what we do is we serve those that are underserved. So a little bit different than a digital space, our public health um, students that come through. So what I my career is completely different from what most of you have done. I graduated from UCSD with a BA in sociology. So nothing to do with public health. So my, um, my way of getting here has been completely different. But there are so many opportunities right now in public health um, for students to be able to be a part of if this is your major, you are definitely in a career choice that has so many opportunities available for you. We have health educators, we have a research institute, you have navigators. There's so many things that you can do to help your community at this moment as a public health um, major or graduate student. So I'm here to give you guys ideas on what that is. Thank you, Carolina. Um, Marcus? Good evening, I'm Marcus. I am a staff analyst for LA County Department of Public Health. I specifically work with our COVID-19 response for the education sector. So I'm working with institutions of higher education, TK through 12 schools, as well as early care and educations on exposure management for COVID-19, as well as prevention and policy development within this sector. And so I've been a part of the response actually from when it very first was created. And it's been a wild ride this whole entire time. It's um, been a lot of long nights. Um, prior to this, I actually am an alumni from UCSD. So I did my undergraduate here and I graduated in 2016. And then I went off and did my master's in epidemiology 
at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and I graduated in 2018. Thank you. And last but not least, um, coming back from last year, we have Salem. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Salem Halatme. Um, I graduated from UCSD in 14. I got my human biology degree there. And then um, in 17, I graduated with my Master of Health Administration. And uh, currently, I work as a manager in a company called ECG Management Consultants. And what we do is we help lead healthcare forward, um, work with clients throughout the country. My current client is in South Carolina, so it's pretty great. Um, and I also am an adjunct professor at USC in the master's program. So um, I've developed recently a love and passion for social determinants of health, specifically health equity. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, growth in that in the, in the public health se sector. So we can talk about that. Um, looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for the introductions. Um, I am so excited to get started with tonight's panel. Um, I think students, you're, you're in for some really interesting stories. Um, so maybe first, uh, Salem, would you be up for telling us a little bit about your career trajectory? Um, if you had a path in mind from the beginning, if anything changed, um, any sort of, uh, sort of unexpected things that happened with your career? Yeah, I think all of us go through some kind of career change as we go along, and that is completely okay. Um, that took me a while to understand personally. So uh, when I was at UCSD, my goal was to become a medical provider. So uh, I am now on the business side of things and not an uncommon experience that uh, students experience. So um, since then, I've realized that you can impact public health or healthcare from many different aspects, whether it's clinical or non-clinical. And so uh, since then, I've had the opportunity to work with many different companies from um, uh, small startups to uh, consulting firms to providers. Uh, so whatever impact I'm having, as, as long as it stays true to my larger goals, I know I'm going in the right direction. So it's not what I'm doing today. It's whether what I'm doing is taking me to where I want to be. And that's how I know I'm on the right path. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Carolina. Would you share with us um, about your career trajectory? I know that you mentioned a little bit when you were very introducing different. yourself. Yeah, so I started off, of obviously, as most people do, when you're young, you want to be an attorney, right? Or you go with your specific ones. Well, um, it ended up, I started working in research administration and I loved it. I figured, knowledge, for me, knowledge is power, right? That is wealth. When you get publications out there, when other people are able to, um, uh, duplicate the work you do, when you get grant applications, all that kind of stuff actually matters. And um, that was in cancer research. Then I started working with uh, as a community outreach program manager for life sharing, which is your pink dot, right? That's donate life. That's how you get people out there to understand what that importance is. Also very important in public health, right? You want people to become organ donors. So it's varied as to what you can do. And I ended up now working for a community clinic, bringing in volunteers, bringing in students so that, that we can continue working on grants to be able to provide support to special populations. Because again, as Salem mentioned, it's all about equity. How do we make that possible? How do we make people understand um, that they have these services that we can provide for them as well? So that is one of my main focuses this year. And I know that we're trying to do that for high school students too. So um, again, for me, that has been my main focus. How can we make healthcare um, available and understandable for um, a variety of populations, not just one group? Thank you. Uh, Marcus, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your career trajectory? Yeah, so for myself, I knew I always had an interest in communicable diseases, and so I found that interest relatively early. I was probably around the age of 10. It was with the bird flu, and so I always knew I wanted to find an opportunity on how to work in that, but I didn't know what opportunities were available to me, whether it be clinical or public health, and I actually didn't know what public health was until I came to UCSD, and so I kind of was able to explore this aspect there, and then I post-graduation, I did find it actually a little bit difficult to find a job in communicable diseases. It's not easy getting started, just wanted to share that. Know that there's a few rejections along the way, but when you get certain opportunities and you find a place that you can really thrive at, it's amazing and awesome. I know myself, um, 
I actually ended up applying to grad school quite recently after undergrad, mainly because I had challenges finding the opportunity of growth that I was looking for. And then post-graduation, you know, you find yourself in roles that you're interested in. And the coronavirus really started my career trajectory. Um, before that, I was working with a team on tuberculosis within LA County. And then I found myself working with COVID. And ever since then, I found my, myself from the very beginning leading teams of anywhere between 30 to 50 people. And right now I'm leading a team of 30. So as different opportunities come your way, don't be afraid to say yes. Definitely step out of your comfort zone. That's one thing that I've learned. Um, and getting out of that comfort zone, you'll be amazed by how much you can accomplish and how much you'll grow. So, yeah. Love that. Thank you. Uh, Lauren? Yeah, so my career trajectory, well, I'm pretty early in my career having just finished my PhD last year. Um, but I actually went to college originally to study uh, international relations, and I never took a single international relations class. My very first class on my very first day of college was Intro to Community Health. And I really never looked back. Um, one of the first books I read in college was Mountains Beyond Mountains about Dr. Paul Farmer's work. Um, and I, it just totally changed my trajectory. I got involved with research pretty early on. Um, and like some of the others on this panel, also uh, really enjoyed um, that sort of work. Did a lot of different internships um, and projects in college. Loved research so much, I wanted to go get a PhD right away. And my advisor cautioned me and said, hey, look, going to graduate school and especially for a doctoral degree is a big financial commitment, a big time commitment. Why don't you work for a couple of years? Make sure you wanna do that and come back to me. And I can write you a letter of recommendation right now and it'll be pretty strong because you're a good student, you've done great research, but if you come back and show that you left and you still wanna do this, my recommendation will be even stronger. Um, so I, I worked as a research coordinator in academic medical centers um, and health systems, and then came to UCSD for my public health PhD. Early on in my PhD, again, I, I realized that something quite didn't quite add up. I really enjoyed the work that I was doing, but I wanted to um, work in a more applied space. And so I did a lot of career exploration during the end of my PhD, which included connecting with Ernesto, um, learning more about digital health. Um, I also looked into consulting, into government careers. Um, like you, Marcus, the COVID-19 pandemic presented some unique opportunities for me. And I uh, took the time to do some case investigation as a volunteer with the County of San Diego and could have very well you know, gone in that direction, but still was really interested in technology and digital health. Um, and so I, I was told that I would need to potentially need to do a postdoc or get some more experience, but I went ahead and applied for jobs and was able to enter industry right away. Um, but it wasn't easy. I definitely had to kind of trust myself, um, work with a lot of mentors along the way. And that's how I got where I am now. Thank you. Um, and I also, I find it actually very funny that you and Ernesto knew each other because the same thing happened last year with Salem and one of our other panelists that I had no idea and I got you both and i um, really excited to have both of your perspectives. So Ernesto, um, maybe you can share a yeah. little bit about your career trajectory. Sure. Um, I think like the, probably the overarching concept with my trajectory has been circuitous. Uh, I, <laughs> Did an undergrad um, in Arizona. I had both my undergrad and my master's in at Arizona State, uh, would not really knowing what I was doing. I actually have an undergraduate degree in finance of all things, um, but did not like to do. Did not like it. Did not want to do it. Although you'll see pretty quickly that it it spurned a lot of uh, love for numbers and, and data analysis. Um, wanted to continue uh, what I was doing at the time, which was racing my bicycle. And a good excuse to do that is go to grad school where you don't have a real job. Um, so I got a, I did a, a master's degree there in exercise science in health psychology because I wanted to be a sports psychologist. And then my graduate advisor uh, wisely said, if you want to be a sports psychologist, you better find a real job first because it doesn't pay. Um, and I got the opportunity to, um, basically assist uh, a researcher that was focusing on uh, children's uh, physical activity within the school setting. And that was my first foray into how technology can be used to 
augment and support some really interesting research questions and took that basically decided this is really cool. How can you make a bigger impact? Well, you can do bigger, better research with a PhD. Let's go do that. And I, honestly, I, I feel like I sort of like right place, right time, lucked into um, a program at UCSD and a lab that was specifically focused on um, how technology could be used to both measure and also impact uh, people's general health. Um, also, just like it's kind of stars aligning there. Uh, the, I think the first, within the first three months of um, me starting the program, the Fitbit, like the original Fitbit was announced that this thing was coming. And that like in my mind was like, this is gonna be a complete game changer. Uh, it takes what we've been doing at high cost and high effort um, in research and makes it very easy for the individual to do. And that led me down this road of uh, spending forever to do my PhD, like way, way too long, um, but integrating with a, a community at the time called Quantified Self was all about personal sensing. So uh, making a lot of contacts there, being on the forefront of kind of this change in culture where people are willing to wear devices that track them and can tell them a little bit about their health or their behavior. And then really kind of wrote, have ridden that wave. I've worked for a, a small startup company that supports um, academic researchers that use wearable devices and then made the jump to uh, a bigger organization now at Evidation Health where we do, you know, pretty large scale groundbreaking research around kind of digital health space. Oh, that was so, very long-winded. Apologies. <laughs> no, I this, see this is I love this about our panels because um, our panelists can really give our students um, some perspective into um, the changes and and the thought process and thing like things like that. So um, actually, I think it kind of goes pretty well into our next question, um, which I think I'll, I'll direct it towards Marcus because Marcus, I think you're you're the latest graduate here. Um, if you think back to when you were an undergrad, um, if you can um, kind of tie some of what you do now into what you did as an undergrad, you know, how did, how did you work as an undergraduate, uh, regardless of your major, because I know not all of you were, were public health majors, but how did your work as an undergraduate kind of lead you toward your career you know, what, what sorts of uh, activities, um, you know, things that you did as an undergraduate do you think helped you the most? And what do you wish you could have done differently? Great questions. It's definitely, um, it's formulating my thoughts right now, but it's gonna be a little bit of a long-winded answer for this. So while I was in my undergraduate program, I was a public health major. So this really guided you know, my whole career. Right now I'm working as a staff an analyst for the Department of Public Health. And so I was able to foster those interests while I was during my undergrad. And then while I was at UCSD, I specifically worked with um, student health advocates as well as the County of San Diego as a student health, what is it? This, mm can't remember the title right now, but as a student volunteer there. And those experiences really provided me with guidance on local government and how we're able to impact um, the community on a local government level. And then also student health advocates showed me health education and how we can impact it that way. I use these skills almost every day. Right now I'm, I'm leading a team of health educators as well as public health investigators. So the foundation that I received is really, you know, I'm, I'm applying it almost on a daily basis, especially with uh, the public health degree. I remember going through the foundational public health courses. I reverted back to some of these lecture slides well into my graduate program, um, just because of the way it was explained so well. So definitely refer back to those notes, save things. And then one thing I wish I did differently that I didn't realize until probably a few years ago was the power of networking. I think a lot of times was, as an undergraduate, you have so many interests and you want to foster them, but you, I thought at the time, the way you get those interests or the way you can kind of explore it is by having an internship or having a job in that category. But I really think it's actually by networking, you know, contacting people, doing an interview with them to see if their career is something that you're interested in or to see what their daily life is like, just to find out and solidify, is this something you actually have interest in? And I think that's a great starting point if you have multiple interests. You know, I know I actually left um, out of UCSD 
thinking I wanted to pursue public policy. And so I actually moved to DC right after. And I was like all gun home on public policy. And I was started working on it for a little bit and realized I really wanted to work with communicable diseases instead. And so there were very two different interests, but I'm actually finding myself right now working in communicable diseases as well as developing local government public policy. So I'm, I'm doing both and it's really satisfying and, it, and I'm, I'm loving it, so yeah. Um, thank you. Lauren, uh, same question. If you think about when you were an undergrad, uh, things that you did help, things that you did that you wish you would have done differently? Yeah, I was reflecting on this just now. And something that I think really helped me in, at each stage, but especially as an undergrad was kind of getting, so I knew I wanted to get research experience, but getting research experience across a variety of topics and a variety of settings. So looking back, all of that sounds very nice. I got such diverse experiences at the time. I was just taking whatever I could get, but it all kind of came together um, and I was able to then grow skills that were consistent across environments and across topics that I was working on. So as starting in undergrad and through my postgrad work and then into graduate school, um, I've studied a lot of different topics. And when I was even just applying for jobs, you know, 10 years, 10 years after graduating from college, I was able to talk about, I've worked on diabetes, I've worked on, uh, you know, Alzheimer's projects and all different topic areas. So I think having a diverse collection of experiences, even if you feel like, oh my gosh, this is all a mess, it's not consistent, I have no story, that is a story that you've worked on so many different things. Um, something that I wish I had done, I'm looking back at your question, something that I wish I would have done differently. Yeah, I- Sorry, yes, <laughs> I yeah, was I, zooming and muted. <laughs> I know, I'm thinking, I think I'd like to come back and add to this. I want to be thoughtful and I, I not something's not coming to me right now. Okay, that's not a problem. Um, we, I appreciate your thoughtfulness. Uh, if you do want to jump in after anyone else has answered, you know, feel free. Sure. Um, how about you, Salem? Uh, do you have thoughts about this? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll jump to the part of what I would have done differently. And I think we get lost in the titles and the degrees and where we wanna go. We don't focus, and I didn't focus as much on the activities, the day-to-day -day activities that I wanna be doing in my job every day. And when people say, what do you wanna do? It's such a vague question, but it can be narrowed when you ask yourself in five years, in 2027, when I wake up on a Monday morning after a long week before that, what do I want to do? Do I want to be in front of a computer? Do I want to be in front of patients? Do I want to talk to people? Do I not? Asking yourself those questions and knowing when you wake up what you're doing that day, five years from now, will help you get you closer to where you want to be. That's what I should have done. I love that advice. I think that that's something that all of our students really can benefit from. Thank you. Um, Nesto. Um, I will, I'll be uh, open and honest here that it's, it's hard to remember what I would have done differently. Uh, undergrad, uh, unfortunately, was 20 years ago for me now, which is scary to admit. Um, but I would say that I, I agree with what everyone has said, um, getting research experience, understanding what it is that you want to do. It, all of these things are, are really important. Um, one thing that I could probably add on to it from my own experience is try to understand or try to um, figure out how you can get leadership experience in whatever way that presents itself um, and is interesting for you. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I you know, started this thing or I, I am like the president of this club, but anything that's gonna allow you to showcase like I have that initiative or I have that experience that um, showcases my skills and expertise in a really interesting way is always really useful. I did a lot of that through, um, actually in my case, a lot of through like club um, uh, type of activities. So, you know, my friend and I, we basically started the cycling club uh, at our, our undergraduate institution. And that was like, that was top of my application when I went into for my uh, master's degree. Um, wasn't as important when I went to my PhD. Research was more important there. But um, I think that's that's the big thing. And then I, I mean, Marcus mentioned networking, and I cannot stress that enough. 
Um, networking is so huge. Like people like, oh, your your resume gets you jobs and stuff, which is true. What really gets your foot in the door um, is who you know and being able to leverage relationships um, for your benefit. I know that feels like probably a little transactional, um, but the like the secret is, is people want to help you when you have a good relationship with them. Um, I like, I literally just hired someone uh, for my team and it was based off of a really great recommendation from another employee within our organization. That kind of relationship building, it cannot be say like, it is, um, it is always gonna be time well spent. Extremely helpful advice, thank you. And uh, I'll just 20 years ago for me too, so I get it. Um, Carlina? I'm also 20 years, so you're not alone in this, so it's okay. Um, I just want to say that one of the things that I think is really important, because you guys are all undergrads, and you don't, I don't know what your life is like, but some of you may be having to work as well, so that means you have to, you know, make money while you're in school to, you know, complete all those things. Never underestimate the power of learning customer service skills. So um, take that as something that is really important. Not only will it benefit your networking abilities, but it also um, helps benefit how you relate to other people, especially when you're working in public health, because you do have to work, speak to a diverse group. Remember that that's always important. And um, keep in mind that and one of the things that I wish that I had done more is um, a lot of what everybody on this panel has done more research. I had no idea what I was getting myself into or wanted to do until well after I graduated from college. And um, I think that I have to commend every single one of you on this panel for at least having an understanding of what you wanted to do during your time in undergrad even all the students here, because I'm going to tell you, I did not. So that's pretty commendable. So that is one thing I wish I had done a little bit more of. But yeah, keep in mind that uh, your customer service skills, skills do matter when you're working with other people. Take volunteer opportunities. If it's something that you can't really research in or like take a internship, remember that there are volunteer opportunities that you can take to work on a grant, to work on any special project that may be out there that gives you the leadership skills that you may not be able to get in other opportunities because of your limited time. So just keep all of that in mind because everybody here has a different um, experience that they're ha having to deal with in college. So be mindful of what you can and can't do. So excellent advice. Wow, this panel is just full of amazing advice. I'm so I'm so happy to have you all here. Um, Carolina, maybe you can get started with get us started with our next question, which is, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your daily uh, tasks are like, what your day to day work is, um, sure. and the types of things that, um, you know, maybe are are ordinary or out of the ordinary, and what you really like about um, your job. I'm very Maybe administrative. Yeah, I'm like, I'm very administrative. So my role, I work with everybody in the organization. So I work with all of the departments that are looking for students. So not only as a public health students, but I work with MBA students, I work with undergrads, grads, so you name it. Um, we have a lot of projects that we have with UCSD and SDSU for their grant foundations, or even within um, UCSD's public health department, right? So my job is to work with all of those PIs, principal investigators. I know that's what you guys know it as, but we just call them managers. And they um, have requests to bring in students and, I, and um, professors or anybody else. And my job is to make sure that they are compliant, right? I get them um, acclimated and ready to join our organization. So my job is to like do a little bit of branding, right? Make them understand what we do and who we serve, make them understand the importance of serving those um, special populations. And then I also make sure that they're compliant. So we can't just have someone walk into a clinic just because they feel like it. So we have to make sure that they understand that there are rules and um, policies and procedures that they have to follow. Um, not of it. Not, that's the boring part, right? My favorite part is the orientation. My favorite part is speaking to the students, getting to know the projects they were they're working on, and what the end results are. So I've been able to 
attend some of the grant seminars and listen in as to what projects they're working on. Some of the students actually apply for grants themselves so that they can continue the work on behalf of our organization. And um, those are the parts that I truly enjoy. But the boring parts are just this, you know, having to do all the administrative work. But it's important because we are audited by so many different organizations that if you don't have any of that, then they come back and they say something. So it's really important that everybody in the organization is aware of what they need to do. Thank you. Um, about Lauren, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your day to day and what you like and maybe don't like? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I will give some like very detailed information and some overview information as well. Um, I, as a research scientist, I have a very technical job. So I'm required to call upon all of my knowledge of different study designs um, and things like that, my analytics knowledge, but I actually spend the majority of my day communicating with other people. So we have lots of different communication tools. I work remotely. Um, I send very few emails. I do a lot of messaging on a platform we use called Slack. Um, and I am always um, asking other people for input, et cetera, et cetera. I actually have very few um, long chunks of time like I did in school to get my work done. So I'm always distracted, but always getting other, other information from people to help me do my job better. Um, I work on, basically we have our digital, digital therapeutics, which are our software products that we are trying to run studies to test them. Um, they're regulated by the FDA. And so our company has to show the FDA that they're effective. And there's very strict guidelines for that. So I work with our regulatory teams to understand what the guidelines are and then design studies to meet the guidelines. I work with our product team to understand what the product is that we're studying. How is it different than other products we make and kind of what are the special requirements? Um, I work with project managers who help to keep us all on track. Um, I sometimes will work with our software developers if we want to ask patients certain questions to ensure that our, um, our measures are getting into our products so that I can kind of generate the right, the right level of evidence to meet the FDA's needs. Um, and I, I'm in meetings a lot of the time as well, communicating with others. Um, it's a really, something that I really like is the diversity of tasks that I get to do. But something that's frustrating is I don't have those long work blocks. So I work it, here, I'm living in San Diego, but most of my team is on the East Coast. So they start their day earlier than I do um, and they sign off earlier than I do. So sometimes I have to wait till the very end of the day to have a couple hours free. To, to do writing and reading, go back into the literature, that sort of thing. Um, but it's a really good mix. I, in general, really like the work that I'm doing. I'm learning so much about technology in particular. Um, and I, oh, I also work with the business development and salespeople who want to sell our products to understand what their needs are when we're designing the studies as well. So I love working cross-functionally, I think is the main thing main challenge um, or thing that's frustrating is just I don't have the same kind of protected work time I had when I was in school. Thank you. Um, Salem. Um, thank you very much. What I get to do at my job every day um, is I get to advise clients in healthcare. Um, I mentioned earlier, my current one is in South Carolina, which means every time I work with a new client, I have to learn all that I can about them, in whatever state that they're in. Um, what that entails on a day-to-day -day basis, a day in the life or a week in my life is, it is balancing standing in front of a, sitting in front of a computer, doing analytics, PowerPoints, crafting a story to tell the right story at the right time, but also providing recommendations and when needed, implementing those recommendations. So it takes the entire gamut of types of activities, both technical and um, interpersonal. And so those two combined is the reason I love it. And I think some of you may end up doing something like that. Uh, and some of you may choose to do one of the other pieces of that. Whatever thing that you choose to do in your career um, is one that needs to align with what you enjoy in life. I think your career is part of your life. So whatever you like and gravitate toward is what you're going to end up doing. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Salem. Um, Ernesto, can you tell us a little bit about what you do every day? 
Uh, sure. Um, so I think, you know, both uh, what, what Lauren and Salem mentioned are, are really apply to, to my work as well, because I'm also working in industry, which is, you know, a lot of cross-functional work, a lot of meetings, um, very, also very rare to have more than an hour of free time. That's not uh, me having to talk to someone about something. Um, but a lot of that is, is actually pretty fun. Uh, my main role is to help solve problems in our organization. So we've got um, a variety of different things that we support. We support clinical trials, we support market research, we support um, pop, uh, technology-based population health tools. And uh, that surfaces lots of interesting issues around uh, during the day. The fun thing is I get to bring my skill set um, both in a technical component and uh, kind of a soft skill managerial component to bear um, almost on a daily basis. So part of my day might be actually like writing code to better um, you know, tell a story or better understand what's going on with a, a particular um, program or a particular study that we're running right now. Um, part of it could be talking to our engineers, our data, other data scientists, about how we architect data, how we store it, why does it work the way we do, and how can we improve it to meet the needs of the next thing that we are going to be supporting in the in the future. Um, part of it is working with our business development folks to design what are those next things. You know, so when someone comes to us with a new idea for a study, or they want to know, um, you know, about what types of treatment people with allergies tend to prefer, and what if those treatments can impact their sleep, and if that sleep can be tracked by a wearable device. You know, I help put together what does that actually look like in practice, um, and how do we actually operationalize vague requests into actionable, like requirements and processes that we implement. Um, yeah, and then part of it is like I do a lot of teaching. Um, I did not go into academics. I immediately left <laughs> after my PhD and went into industry. Um, but the thing that is still, I think, I've carried over is uh, how amazing it is to help teach someone um, a new thing and kind of walk them through a process or an idea and watching them solve a problem using you know, the techniques or the skills that you, you give them over time. So part of the fun part of my job is bringing new people in and helping them understand how we work the way we work. Thank you. Marcus, do uh, you wanna tell us a little bit about your day-to-day? Yeah, my day to day is actually quite interesting, mainly because I've worn so many hats throughout this pandemic response that my day to day is not the same. I think I'm finally to a point within the last three months where my day to day is looking quite the same. And since we've come out of this, um, this last surge, things are definitely mellowing down to where I'm able to have a little bit more of a routine. But as I kind of started working on the COVID response, I wasn't in the position I originally was in. So I was actually focusing a lot more on case investigations, providing a lot of guidance, and then I transitioned into policy development, as well as providing a lot of exposure management. But from an educational standpoint, like educating our student part, our, our school partners, as well as my team, right? I, I worked with a team of public health investigators and health educators and have to make sure that they're well familiar with our guidance to be able to provide this guidance to our schools, as well as do site visits. And so we, we have a lot of multiple hats that we're wearing, whether we're in the office or, or sorry, not in the office, working remotely from our homes or doing a site visit. And depending on what situations arise throughout the day, I could be pulled into something at a moment's notice. So some oftentimes I have random emails at four or five o'clock where I'm being pulled into something that we need to investigate or provide guidance on by the following morning, as well as I know since the beginning, my day to day, I've always had a meeting from 8 a.m. to 8.30 and then a following meeting from three to four in the afternoon discussing just what day's events happened because things have just escalated. So my, my day to day is just very different, but the main topics that I continuously assist with are always exposure management guidance, policy development, policy evaluation. And I really like it when we get a little bit of more downtime because we're able to evaluate the policies and do a little bit more research design and evaluation to things that we're, we're doing because we're doing it so quickly. We want to make sure that it's, you know, effective or making a positive impact. So, yeah. That's it. Thank you. 
Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, now, I know not all of you are necessarily uh, involved in hiring decisions. Um, so if you aren't uh, involved in hiring, uh, just I want you to think back um, to the last time that you were interviewing. Um, but for those of you who are involved in hiring, um, this, this question is primarily directed toward you. Um, what do you look for in an applicant? How do applicants um, stand out in a good way? And what are some things to avoid? And for those of you who maybe aren't involved in hiring decisions, um, if you can think back to um, interviews that you've had, um, applications that you've made, uh, and <clears throat> things that you felt were helpful or not helpful um, in your experience. Um, perhaps maybe we'll start with Salem. Thank you. Um, I recently actually did a round of resume reviews and mock interviews for students. Um, and I learned a lot from doing those in just the past few weeks. Um, I will summarize those briefly. I think knowing yourself and what you've done is step one is there's a lot of things that you've learned or continue to learn that you may not be aware of are transferable to whatever job you're applying for. So know your worth, because sometimes when I look at a resume, it's not showing me what it needs to show when you've actually done the work. And number two, it's if you're in a position or you're about to be in a position and you want to grow your skill set, you want to go into it, especially for those who are unpaid positions, you want to go into it knowing what you want to get out of it. And so I would want you to envision what your resume will look like after you're done with that position, if it's a set time. So in a year, what bullet points will be on your resume so you can communicate those and make sure you're tracking against them, not looking backward, like, okay, I just finished my position. What did I do and learn? Let me reflect those on my resume. I want you to think proactively about it. Um, and then I think finally, it is taking the time to polish up your image, whether it's online in a LinkedIn profile or whether it's in paper, like a resume, to make sure that, that like I said before, reflects what you've done, but also reflects it in a way that don't make little errors, don't make grammatical errors, uh, you know, commas here and there, those small things people pick up on and you would think it is not important, but if someone picks it up and then notices it and they have an equal competitor, why would they want to talk to you when they have someone that went the extra step? So always go the extra step there, but don't overdo it, I think. Um, that's my advice. Thank you. Um, Ernesto, I saw a lot of uh, a lot of nodding. I mean, I just so I just hired someone and I went through a whole round of um, resumes and, and interviews. Um, take home uh, uh, exercises as well. And I can't, uh, I can't stress enough what Salem just mentioned, which is like, please just proofread um, that like that little things um, really matter a lot because a lot of what people want is someone that has attention to detail that, you know, when you're going to uh, get into the job market, they want someone who like, is going to pay attention, is going to do excellent work. Um, so I've primarily been uh, hired for uh, data scientists, so master's, PhD level data scientists and or researchers. And the biggest things on that I look for are, do you have the skills that actually match with what is required of the job? So we try to be very explicit around, this is what we require and this is kind of what's good to have. And at least if you meet the, like, this is what's required, you can get your foot in the door. Um, and then have that conversation. But once you have the conversation, a lot of it is, are you are you going to meet the the needs of of that role? Um, can you express your skills and your experiences in a way that matches well with you know what that job description has? Um, and a lot of times, I'll be honest, I I look at what questions people ask of me or other team members in interviews to understand like are what do they really care about? What's the thing that's on top of their mind? And some of my, like the best applicants have talked, uh, I've actually asked about um, cultural things. You know, what is work-life balance? How do people, um, how do you work with people that have, you know, um, new families or things of that nature? Um, because it, it shows to me that like, yes, you're gonna, you take this stuff seriously, but also that, you know, some of the, let's say non like skill dependent stuff is also important to you, which, at least on my end, is very important as well. Thank you. Lauren, do you have anything to add to this discussion? 
Yeah, no, I'm not a hiring manager at our current company. Company I was supposed to be by now, but as a startup, um, priorities and things change all the time. So I've had to be flexible. So I'm excited to hopefully get to do that soon, but have been a part of um, many hiring cycles um, at my company. Um, I also echo what Ernesto said about asking questions. Um, and so not only does it make you look good, but it's important for your own knowledge. Best case scenario, you end up with multiple offers and you have to pick. So also ensure that you're using the opportunity you have in the interview to get the information that you need to be able to make an informed decision. Even if you don't have multiple offers, but you're not quite sure it's the right place, try to, try to use the interview to genuinely get the information that you need and share the information that you feel is the most important for them to know as well. Um, our company kind of as a little bit tangential, but our company does hire people straight out of um, a bachelor's in public health as research, research assistants um, and clinical research coordinators. We hire MPH students at more of the associate level and then the scientists as well. Um, so if you're not seeing roles at like tech companies at your level, it doesn't mean they don't exist. They maybe just don't come, off as, come up as often, but they are out there. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. We always get lots of students that have questions about what they can do right out of college. So it's always important for us to know as well. Um, Marcus and then Carolina, I know that you have uh, hiring that you're actually doing. So that's why I'm having you wait till the very end. Um, so Marcus. Yeah, I'm just going to add, I actually went through recruiting my entire team within the last three months. I went through hiring about 15 people. Um, and I cannot stress enough, be professional and do your research. Uh, it's definitely noticeable very early on in the interview. And I, I went through mass recruiting. So I was having to interview a lot of candidates. You know, my other colleagues here are sharing, picking one candidate or two candidates. So mine's a little bit of a different situation on the way I approached this and went through it, but definitely send thank you letters. You know, I can't tell you how far a thank you letter will go. So that, that's definitely um, the advice that I wanna share. Thank you. Oftentimes we hear that that's kind of an old fashioned thing to do. So it's really important um, for students to know that that's still important. Carolina, I know that you've been waiting for this. So I wanted to uh, have you kind of wrap this one up because I know that you uh, have a lot I, of as, Yes. Uh, so as a community clinic, we definitely look at new a student or newly graduated students to come in, even those that are still in school. So that's something to keep in mind if you are a public health major and you want to dive in and figure out if this is something you want to do. You can always apply for a community health clinic as a health navigator, as a health educator. There are roles out there for you that are per diem that go around and they do community outreach that you can really dive in and see if this is something you're interested in doing. These roles lead to managers in specific programs. We have substance abuse programs. There's so many things that you can be a part of if this is the route you wanna go down, especially in public health. Um, one thing that I always state that I know is important because my job is to speak to the students before they speak to the hiring managers, especially if they're coming in um, looking for an internship that's um, maybe we only have two interns that we wanna bring in, but there's 15 applicants. Know the company. Do your research on the company, understand what their mission is, who they're there to serve, what their role is in the community in general, um, what project that you, that you may be interested in serving, is there a special population you want to work with, what would that look like. The great thing about places like community clinics or even smaller areas, they do have research institutes now that they are looking for new, new graduates or even current graduates that want to come in and just do work that way. So um, there are opportunities, if that's what you want to do, that lead to um, greater roles in the future, but gives you that nice base, gives you an understanding, like makes it so that you can build on your resume as well. So I always say that about family health centers. Yes, we know that we want you to stay here, but a lot of the times we are the groundwork for you to continue on with your career. And we are appreciate that because then that means that you go out and you can still talk about us and let others know about us because branding is important. So um, we find it really important to, to always um, keep that relationship going. I know um, if you guys are students at Public Health, we work with Dr. Godino, right? He's one of our, um, he's a huge guy that he's, he, he's influential 
in a lot of the projects that we have going on. So you can always speak to him about um, internship opportunities. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to give students a heads up that we have two more uh, questions that I have, and then hopefully we can have some questions um, coming in from you. So I do want students to think uh, about if there's anything that we aren't addressing. If you have additional questions, um, you can start to put them in the chat box if you like, or after we finish up our questions, the two more questions that I have, um, then we can also uh, have a situation in which uh, you can raise your hand uh, here in chat, ask the questions, etc. whichever you prefer. Um, so like I said, we do have two more questions. Um, and the first one, um, I guess I'll direct to you, Carolina. Um, what advice can you give to students who are struggling to decide about their future career plans? We get so many students that just aren't sure exactly what they want to do, or they're trying to decide between two things, or they, they don't know whether they need they want to go to graduate school, et cetera. Is there any advice that you can give to them? Um, always try every opportunity that's put in front of you. So that's basically all I can say. You may not like it and you may have one option that you chose over the other, but at least you went forward and you completed it and you can say, I don't like that. I'm going to go try that other thing. But um, know that if an opportunity is presented to you, um, take it, try it, like go for it. Um, that was one of my favorite things working on in college, working on a sociology project that I was not supposed to be a part of and then I became part of it. And that made me um, really, really appreciate research and what individuals do to like get data. I feel, I love, what is it? I think the Data Institute at UCSD, I think is one of the coolest things ever. Data scientists are the future. So just keep that in mind. I'm like, thank you Ernesto and Lauren for what you do, but I know that that is the future. So those are things that you can keep in mind with public health metrics do matter. So um, just try everything. Well, then uh, let's hear from the future. Ernesto, can you tell us a little bit uh, um, about uh, what advice you would give to students? Um, uh, I would say uh, probably a few things. Um, one, um, what Caroline said, like try new things. Don't be afraid to jump into something, even if you're not 100% sure. Uh, I don't think we live uh, anymore in a world um, that is looking for you to make a choice on the day you graduate and you're going to stay at that job for the next 30 years and then collect your pension uh you know when you're 65 like that that doesn't really exist anymore i mean it does for some people for sure but i think the for the vast majority you know um people understand that you you do change jobs you do change career paths and you can take things um from one uh one path to the other i mean just as a, a kind of a weird aside my, my wife is interviewing for i was a, interviewing for a job last week we're talking to a recruiter and she's been at her current company for 12 years. And that was like a huge, big surprise for the recruiter, like 12 years. Like that's that's crazy these days to be there for 12 years. Um, so don't be afraid to like, to, like you said, um, try new things. Um, if that doesn't work out, be gracious, you know, don't burn a bridge, but, you know, you know, make an exit strategy and figure out what that next thing would be. Um, also, like tr by trying new things, be pub uh, more public about what you're trying. Um, when I'm looking at people uh, in terms of like uh, hiring and when, you know, looking for potential, you know, who's out there doing interesting stuff, what you put out in the public space is super important. You're doing cool projects, you're learning data science, you're doing courses on the side um, to, to, you know, learn a new skill, you know, put that somewhere where see, people can see it, you know, be, get familiar with GitHub, if that's your flavor, you know, write a blog, you know, whatever it is that you can do to showcase your work. Um, it's going to be useful for two things. One, people will see it and you can point people back to it, but also just gives you that experience of trying something to see whether or not that that fits with, uh, you know, what you want to do. Thank you. Um, Salem. So I want to kind of summarize what we're what everybody else has been sharing and just put it maybe in a step by step framework so you all can walk away with something that you might not, um, I guess, forget. So the way I would look at it is I would think first about it. I would talk to the people who are doing the work that I might be interested in and I would test that field. So going to the first one, what does thinking about it mean? I talked a little bit about it earlier, and that is. Think about the activities that you want to be doing. Look forward to the future of that, those specific 
parts of the field, whether it's the level of activities or the income that you're looking to make. And then once you narrow that list to a few titles or future positions, you talk to those people who are doing the work. When you talk to them, does that excite you or does that make you feel unhappy or unexcited? If it excites you, then you go to the last step, which is let me get an internship, let me get a job, or let me make this my career if I'm so sure about it. And then it's a cycle. It does not mean you get it right. Ernesto just said that you can leave. It's okay. Actually, there's a lot of studies that show staying more than a few years at one company hurts your future earning potentials because you're not getting as many raise bumps in some instances. Um, and so think about it that way and know that it's always going to keep changing. It's never just one straight line. Thank you. Um, Marcus. I'm a little stumped because I was going to say something a little similar to Salem. I definitely just want to reiterate doing professional interviews, you know, write down what you're interested in, find people that are doing it. And if it's your a day to day, you know, interview them, see if they have different opportunities for you, if it's something you're interested in, even after that interview. And then in um, addition to that, you can also see different certification classes, like Ernesto was saying, because you, by you independently studying, you know, you can develop either foster that interest or no. I don't want to spend my time doing this and you can move on to something else. So that's it. Thank you. How about you, Lauren? Yeah, I totally agree and align with what everybody said so far. I would also say, think about the lifestyle that you want, not just your earning potential, but the working conditions that you're looking for. Um, and when you do just go about trying things, which you should definitely just try things, use that as a criteria too, to evaluate, um, you know, how does it feel for you? I'm thinking about things like burnout and the importance of self-care. Those are important variables too. Um, and if you try a path that is not, you know, positive in those areas, then um, pivot and, and try something different. Um, but ultimately I agree with everybody to, you just have to try things and it's kind of a process of elimination. I like Salem's framework for the process of elimination though. That's very, I, I can tell you're working consulting. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, so just one last question for everyone. And I want you to think back over pretty much all of the time before you started your current position. Okay, so uh, this is this is as an undergrad, as a grad student, um, in your previous positions, etc. Um, what sorts of things do you feel were really, really helpful that you took with you to this position? Um, what sorts of things do you wish that you maybe would have done differently? Um, so I know several of you had talked about this in the context of being an undergraduate, but also I know that there's an awful lot to be learned in previous positions, in graduate positions, and research as a, grad, as a graduate student, et cetera. What sorts of things did you take with you to this position? Maybe Marcus, can you start us off? Yeah, um, I just jotted down two things right now off the top of my head. I definitely think leadership. So being able to speak freely and to talk in front of people, you know, it definitely goes a long way, um, as well as customer service. I had no idea how much customer service I was going to use in any of the roles I've ever held. And being able to com communicate professionally goes such a long way. And then just getting back to leadership, you know, it's one thing to communicate professionally. It's another to communicate professionally in front of a group of people. You, um, so definitely put yourself outside the comfort zone to lead meetings, to lead presentations, to lead special projects, and it'll go very far. Thank you. Salem, what else did you have to add? Uh, that was great. Um, I'm gonna go off of it a little bit. A uh, couple of things. One is people are the most important aspect of everything that you do, um, no matter what you're doing. And so that means that learning how to work with different people, whether it's on a project or whether it's just friends, um, sometimes we encounter people that we may not get along with. And that is very important to understand why we didn't, because whatever personality, personality type we don't get along with, we need to know how to work with that in the future. Um, and the second point to that is balancing your professional self and your personable self um knowing when to use this professional tone and when to use the professional language 
versus when it's just one on ones behind the scenes where you can just be more of your true, you know, un, you know, unstoppable personality. And um, th that took some time for me to truly pin down. And I want to emphasize that it may seem like it's something that's just learned or just comes with time, but you can proactively listen to how people speak, listen to how they communicate, and then almost mimic that, but know when to do it. You don't want to overdo it because then you're just a robot. Um, that's how I see it. And I think that's very important. Thank you. Lauren. Yeah, I would say the ability, something that I feel like I've acquired and taken to this role is the ability to work quickly. Um, and that has been something that I've had to learn in different contexts, even thinking back to, and I apologize for, again, getting a little off track from the initial question, thinking back to even in my educational career too, as a student, procrastinating, you're giving yourself really tight timelines. And if you can learn to perform well under tight timelines, that can actually help you later. Um, so don't keep procrastinating, but if you are, there are upsides to that. Um, and I can, I can think about in every role I've had, something changes at the last minute and I have to redo it and it can feel like a panic, but actually it's helping me refine my skill of being able to do something really quickly. That's good advice for those of us who procrastinate. <laughs> All right, Carolina. I was piggybacking off what everybody says, know your audience. It's really important, to, like Salem said, to be aware of who you're speaking to and how you're speaking to them. Uh, my favorite thing that I've ever learned, and this is when I worked in a jewelry store, and she is still one of my managers that I look up to, is not what you say, it's how you say it that matters. So even when you're interviewing for a position, if you're working with your teammates, if you're leading a project, anything like that, you literally, you should be mindful of the words you use and how it's going to be presented to others. It makes a huge difference um, when it comes to how the team will feel. So it makes the team feel more comfortable if they're aware of what your goals and um, objectives are. So it's really important to keep that in mind. But that's stayed with me for the past 20 years. Thank you. And Ernesto. Yeah, um, I think, you know, everyone has mentioned some, some really great stuff. And I think um, Marcus mentioned um, leadership, and it, it made me think that uh, when you're hired um, for a position, people are hiring you for your skills and your expertise and your knowledge. Um, they're not hiring you to be quiet. And I, I think that is something that people struggle with all the time. I've seen it like, it doesn't matter who, could be PhD, could be a, a, a fresh uh, out of school undergrad. Um, being able to be a, a leader in the room is something that is always going to be useful and practicing that, like almost to what Salem said, practicing that voice, that experience um, and that method of communicating is really just like, it is one of the most, most important things. Um, and in some cases, like learning how to challenge other people, but challenge other people in a professional way that um, is communicated well. It is like that that type of um, experience, that type of skill set is like it goes far, regardless of you know whether you're working in a super technical field or you're you know working in in a, in a medical field. Like that type of, of experience will be super beneficial. That's wonderful advice all around. Thank you everyone um, for all of your thoughtful answers. Um, Everyone who are, are our students who are here um, participating, listening, um, please do think about if you have questions for our panelists. Um, I do see one here in um, the chat, uh, but if you would prefer, please do feel free to raise your hand and then you can unmute yourself as well. Um, I, uh, the, the question that we have from the chat, um, actually we've got two now, um, we have a question about what are some certifications or side courses that you all would recommend trying out? Uh, I'll take this real quick. I mean, I think this is sort of dependent. Like there's no like, oh, it's this one course is gonna like just be the thing that's gonna be helpful. Um, if you're trying to go into a technical field, like Carolina mentioned, data science is the future. I will not disagree. Like half of, not half, maybe a quarter of my job is data science related. Um, 
if that is where you want to practice in the future, that's where you want to get your skills, anything that's going to, to level up that skill set is going to be useful, whether it's Coursera, whether it's actual coursework, um, whether it's online certifications, like those will be super, super useful. Um, other things that are going to be useful are just like actually some good business practices um, or coursework that, that get you familiar with like business tools. This is like literally your Excel's, your, your words, your PowerPoints, all of that stuff is super, super useful. Like you think you may know how to do like Google Slides well, um, but doing it in a professional setting where you're presenting work to, you know, investors or to clients that have paid you tons of money to do something is a different thing than presenting, you know, to, to a class and doing that professional development in those areas is actually really, really worth the time. That's excellent advice. Anyone else have any any other courses or certifications that they would recommend? If I could just add to Ernesto, um, I think if you know what you want to do, get good at what you want to do. Certify in whatever you want to do. If you don't know what you want to do, do Excel and PowerPoint really, 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 really well. And what I mean by that is know how to analyze, not just Google using Google Sheets, try to get a version of Excel and know how to present your thoughts using images and words without overdoing it. Um, so a slide should be able to display your thoughts clearly and efficiently. If you could do that in your current projects in school or in your internships, you will succeed in any kind of business function or form. So, but that's if you don't know what you want to do. You should do it anyway. <laughs> it's, it's good advice regardless because pretty much everybody's going to make some sort of presentation. Um, we do have a couple of students who have raised their hand. Um, so Seva, um, I think you were the first one to raise your hand. Yeah, hi. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you all for taking the time to come and speak with us today. I know, at least for myself, you guys have cleared up a lot of the questions that I have as I near graduation, but I guess my question is mostly geared towards Salem. Um, right now, I'm pursuing public health and business, and I do hope to get my master's in health administration down the line, but in the next couple of years, I want to gain some experience in the field before I dive into grad school. So what do you think are some good entry level roles or positions that myself or other people looking to break into the health administration and management side um, should be looking into applying that would provide us with these necessary skills and experience to prepare us for a career? Thank you. Um, that's, that's actually simpler than you might think uh, the answer to that. So I would, since you want to work in healthcare, I would find a health system or a large enough health group that could offer you a position, first of all, that can offer you um, exposure. Number two is getting a position within a within a team that does have that exposure. So don't have a team, don't do your best not to work with a team that just does one thing, because you're only going to explore that one thing. So find yourself a team that has their tentacles in a lot of different parts of the organization. And then not only do you get that experience, but you get to see which part you like. And so then if you do want to end up doing anything, whether it's staying with a health system, hospital, clinic, or maybe doing consulting or any kind of business services, then you can do anything at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Cindy, you also had your hand up? Hi, yes. Um, my name is Cindy. I would just like to say thank you so much for coming again. Um, so I am a second year in my master's of public health here at UCSC about to graduate. And one of the things that I've been struggling with in like the job search is looking at um, job titles when you're going through um, for a job, looking for job opportunities, because it doesn't seem like public health really falls under one exact title that's easy like to be searchable. So what are some advices or like um, tips on how to navigate that? Because I am in just in interested in industry and working with medical devices? What uh, what part of medical devices do you want to work in? Oh, hey, my daughter's here. Just, you might see a little girl. Hi. Um, um, so right now I have been looking at um, companies like Hologic and Dexcom, but I also oh, yeah. have a part-time job um, doing content management, working with the research library for Fitabase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I was also like a former college athlete. So anything um, physical activity related is also very interesting. Yeah. So um, 
uh, yeah, in, in industry, it would be extremely exceedingly rare to see public health in the um, actual job zone. Give me one second. Um, so uh, I would say that research positions are going to be available for at the uh, master's level or MPH level, um, potentially regulatory or entry level regulatory positions where you're learning about or implementing um, clinical trial SOPs or learning about kind of the FDA regulatory process, um, especially in the medical device field, like that is a super highly regulatory, regulated environment. Um, and if that's of interest to you, of learning kind of that skill set, which is actually also very highly transferable because anything that touches the FDA has to go through a very, you know, um, specific process. Um, yeah, I think that's, those are the things that come to mind. I mean, Dexcom's a really great one. If you're looking for medical device companies in San Diego, actually, there's quite a few in the diabetes space in San Diego specifically. Um, I feel like I really didn't answer your question. So feel free to I can, follow up. I can, add, I can add in to Erna <laughs> yeah. what Ernesto said is totally true. And my company is actually trying to become a software as a medical device company. So I can echo that um, kind of pivoting into regulatory stuff from public health is a very natural transition. Your ability to um, you know, think critically about things um, and understanding of research will be helpful. But in any event, if that's not what you'd like to do, there are plenty of other options. I would recommend. Um, you know, focusing on search terms in the job descriptions, if possible. I don't know which search engines you're using, but you're absolutely right um, that the titles can just be so off. Um, so I would say if you can broaden your search to the different skills that you're thinking of, that will help uh, yield some things. And then also don't be afraid to apply for a job that you don't meet the requirements. There's a lot of myths around that. And um, sometimes jobs will have you know, the requirements and then the nice to haves, but even if you don't meet the requirements, apply. You don't know who else is applying. True. I also am not sure that I answered your question, so please feel free to ask a follow-up. Cindy, was that helpful? Did you have any other follow-up questions? Yes, I think that was very helpful. I had one follow-up question. Um, besides, if I'm not looking specifically at the research side of industry, what things would an MPH also allow me to do? What is your specific area of focus? Technology and precision health. Okay, so um, technology and precision health, I think there are, if you're looking at the intersection of health and technology, there are quite a few um, companies and products out there in the world. Software as a medical device is a huge one that's only going to grow as more digital therapeutics get approved by the FDA and that becomes more commonplace. Um, but there are also quite a few products. Um, the mental health space is like booming right now, um, as uh, is the um, sort of, a, what would you call it? Um, kind of like the, the digital health programs world. So this is your Omadas of the world, your Verdas, things of that nature. Um, the roles that are that would um, be interesting or potentially useful for you as an MPH person would be um, potentially in like the product world. So taking the skills that you know from a research standpoint, standpoint, um, layering on the fact that you understand health, human behavior, technology, and and um, getting into entry level product positions could be really useful. So taking that and saying like, okay, I know about health and now I can learn within the context of industry of how do we develop health and healthcare products that touch consumers or patients. Um, so that could be an interesting place to look for is that, that kind of that product, um, maybe not product management, but, but some, some other product focus role. Thank you. That actually, yes, that is actually what I am interested in, which is why I had that question of like what job title would that fall under? Because those like specifications don't really like fit within one like nice, clean job title. Yeah. Many jobs don't fit within one clean <laughs> job title um, in any industry, but especially in one that's interdisciplinary like ours. Um, so I think that it's, I think what everyone said about kind of looking at things you're interested in is, is really helpful. 
Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I know that uh, Brianna has been hanging out for a little bit. Uh, she had sent me her question directly and then she's just raised her hand. So I don't know if it's the same question, Brianna, but please feel free um, to go ahead and unmute yourself. It's actually a different question, but thank you so much. Um, uh, my question's kind of connected to what some of you guys have been saying um, regarding like not meeting all the job requirements on a job posting. Um, I'm interested in breaking into more of a technical position, um, like a data analyst type position. And I was wondering like um, how willing are companies to be able to let you learn on the job? Um, like, would you say that, especially for an entry level position, like, is it realistic to think that's part that they're gonna have some leeway up for that? Or should I just go for trying to teach myself everything like Coursera and all those online um, courses? I can, I can take this one, or at least start with it. I would say many companies are very willing, but you have to show that you put some effort into it. And not only speaking to it, but a lot of them will have some kind of test, some kind of Excel-based test. I just got a, one of my students reached out with a question he did not answer. So um, that's very common. So I would say at minimum, depending on the requirements, if you're diving into Excel, you would need to know at least some of the functions and some of the pivot table functionality. So if you can get to that level, which is not too advanced of a level, and you can do that on your own, just Coursera or LinkedIn Learning or YouTube for free, um, you would set yourself up for success because it's not just doing it, it's knowing how to speak to how you would do it, even if you don't know how to do it all the time. So that's what I would do. Uh, yeah, I would I would say, um, you know, if you're looking at specific like uh, actual like um development languages for for data analysis like if you're looking at hey i really want to like i want to be um able to analyze and and do data analysis with with python or r or something of that nature it's the same you have to show some initiative that you're on that pathway to you know not that you don't definitely don't have to be an expert but you have to be able to speak the language and you know walk through how do you actually use some of the core functionalities so if you like, if you're like, I want to be a data analysis, a data analyst, and most of the jobs are mentioning Python, like get pandas, get a book on pandas and just like work through it, work through all the examples. Um, like I mentioned, put stuff online to showcase like, hey, here's an interesting project I did, or look, I'm on Kaggle and you can see where I've scored, I've scored on different um, challenges or, or gosh, what do they call them? They're comp some of those competitions that they have. Um, that is really, really useful. Uh, and it also meant makes you want to make sure you look for the roles that are actually going to help you um, learn and grow in that field. So like I wouldn't, if you're like, okay, I'm, I'm still learning how to do this stuff. I'm not quite sure. Probably wouldn't apply for like a senior level machine learning person <laughs> or something like that. Like, you know, know where you fit in and, and be like, be open, honest, like this is where I'm at, where, where I'm at. This is what I'm willing to do. And this is, um, you know, kind of like how I'm putting my um, kind of my own money on the table to learn this stuff. You. Uh, thank you. I just had one follow up question. Um, do you guys have any advice on like practicing like using R and Python um, besides following exercises in like a textbook? <laughs> because I know like myself, like I picked it up during like an internship where I was actually like applying it using it every day. But I find that now that I'm not in that environment anymore, and a lot of my coursework isn't really dealing with R, that it's kind of leaking out of my brain and slipping away. So <laughs> any advice? <laughs> they, like, there, there is no, um, it's not a surprise that people call these languages. Um, it is just like a second, like, you know, spoken language or written language that you will lose unless you practice. Um, I, I would say like find something that's interesting to you and throw yourself at that application. Uh, I am a complete nerd and I like basketball and I will recreate like NBA visualizations in R on like at night just because it's it's a fun to do and see, see if I can do it. And it's good practice for me since we're primarily a Python shop and I don't get to develop in R that often. Um, especially like in R, like the, the other two things is um, both R and Python are fantastic languages. Sorry if I'm getting too technical on this stuff. Um, because they are open source, 
um, they're free to use, and the IDEs are also open. You can, you know, use a variety of um, development environments from our studio to Jupyter Lab notebooks, things of that nature. And there are vibrant open communities on the internet that are that you can become a part of. There are Slack communities. There are people that um, navigate around um, just like learning a new textbook that's based off of these things that you can become part of. Um, the, the one, the two examples that come to mind right now is the R for data science community. Like if you look that up, there's a book, there's an online community, there's a whole Slack channel for that or Slack community for it. There is something called Tidy Tuesday. So in R, there's the idea of um, the Tidyverse, which is a data modeling framework. And you can, they basically every Tuesday, they say, hey, here's the data set we're working on. Here's the visualization that we're all trying to recreate. And you can look on Twitter and it's just tweet after tweet of different people's interpretations of that and their code that they're sharing openly. Um, that stuff is super, it's like, it's just there waiting for you to like be a part of if you wanna be a part of it. Sorry, I will nerd out on that kind of stuff all day long. So apologies if I take too much time there. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's wonderful. Um, I just want to make sure that we get to Daniel's question, uh, which he asked a little while ago um, in chat to me. Um, so I want to make sure that it gets addressed. Yeah, um, he says, this question is specifically for Marcus. Um, I know you alluded to reaching out as a volunteer in the County of San Diego when you started your work in public health. I had some difficulty finding entry-level positions at the County of San Diego for public health, what would your advice be to try and get involved in public health work for the government? Is it more networking oriented or is it more procedural starting with volunteering? If it helps, I'm an undergrad focused on community health, mental health, substance use, and research. Carolina, you may also have some um, perspectives on this. So definitely working with local governments is a little bit challenging getting your foot in the door. There's a process to it. And so I know for myself, when I was an undergrad, I was um, a student worker. So this was the title and you can actually only hold it while you're in school. So undergraduate students can do it as well as graduate students and you're compensated very nicely for being in school. So I definitely recommend applying to those if you're still actively in your education process. And I know for my application, I recall for um, the County of San Diego, as a student, you're just applying to the general student position, but then you can specifically pick the departments you would like to work in. And because you're a student, there's a lot of different activities that you can find yourself doing. I recall I was working with the, what was it? people experiencing homelessness who currently had HIV. And so I was working on a special project in that within San Diego when I was in my undergrad. And it was quite interesting. And then getting into post-grad, I then applied to the County of Los Angeles. And I hate to say it, I just got really lucky with the position I got because when I was first hired, multiple people told me this doesn't happen right out of grad school. I don't know how you got hired with the county. So I don't have a great, guidance there for a, full, for a county position, but I do know I've been doing a lot of recruitment with contracted roles for the county. And so don't be afraid to look for contracted positions, you know, find recruiters, find contractors. They want it, their job is to pair you with um, a job that you're interested in exploring and selling you as a candidate, right? So definitely do not be afraid in your early careers to work through contract agencies, especially if you're struggling to kind of find an opportunity It may be the foot in the door that you need. And on that note, I'd like to say a couple of things too, since it is community health that you are interested in. Um, I, we always have volunteer positions open. Not only did we have it during like the, co the craziness of COVID, but um, we have positions available that work with our HIV population, that work with our substance abuse disorder. I think San in San Diego, we're one of the only organizations that have a safe syringe program that is volunteer-based. So if that is something you are interested in, that is a great way to get your foot in the door, to get the experience, because not only they do give you the training, we do a really good job of making sure all our volunteers are trained on how to communicate with these populations. I've been there, you can work with mobile medical units. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do um, to get your foot in the door that you would only have to work four hours a week to come in on an evening so that you can volunteer that way so that you have some experience that's added to your resume, especially as an undergrad. So um, things to keep in mind, we 
always hire any of our volunteers or students that are interested in the long run when we have um, positions that do become available, but as health navigators, so they become case managers that work with our patients as well. So these are things to keep in mind, especially if you want to work with the county, because as a federally qualified health center, who do we work with? We work with the county all day long. So we have contracts with the county to help the homeless population, to help um, substance abuse programs. So um, just there are avenues that you can look into that would get your foot in the door. So you can uh, definitely reach out if you want to learn more. Thank you. We do have one more question, and I'm not 100% sure who might be the, our best expert on, on the, of the, for the answer uh, to this. Um, but uh, James asks, I'm looking to, to work that intersects with public health, ecology, particularly as it relates to climate change. How would one get started on a path toward that end? Um, James, I know in um, chat, I also uh, mentioned that you should uh, speak with Dr. Ben Marina um, since he does a lot of work with that. I wanted to mention it verbally as well in case uh, any other students were had the same kind of question and were wondering. I have somebody I can connect you with. So this is an example. I don't have an answer, but one of um, his graduate students um, is now a postdoc um, at the University of Washington and is studying this topic. So um, Daniel, I don't know if you can send me a private message, but connect with me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to make a connection. And that is the power of networking, perfect. Well, I think that we're just about out of time. I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all of our panelists. You were amazing. Um, I'm so thrilled to see students uh, so engaged. Uh, this is the most questions we've had at any panel um, that I have actually um, involved with. So this makes me super happy. Um, you were all wonderful. You had great insight and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank Can you. I say one thing really quickly. I would sure. like to say thank you to Lisa as well. And just so y'all know, we went to high school together. So we did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> I almost said it earlier. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all so, so much. And I appreciate all of your insights. Um, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Okay.